Take your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 12. That's where we'll be tonight. If I may, I'd love to give you a brief, brief testimony about what all the Lord's done in my heart this summer and what all He's been working on me with. Um, he surely is at work, and that wasn't a lie. That camp is something special. And I'm just, I'm just praying that the Lord will still use me to be a vessel for Him. And I can pour all that He's given me into all the kids that, and teenagers that come across the way. And I sure am grateful to be there. The first week started off, and it was amazing. We had these, these, uh, these children from this church, and you guys poured into them all the time. You provided a way for them to go, and they, were, they went, and they took advantage of every opportunity. And the Lord was pleased. I'm sure the, the preaching was amazing. Uh, you know, you might know the guy who, who spoke that week. Uh, Pastor Cody brought great, wonderful messages, and we saw one of our young people come to know the Lord that week. And that was a tremendous blessing, and that, that made the whole summer worth it. If one soul was to trust the Lord, every bit of labor, every bit of anything that we got ourselves into was all worth it after all. And he's just continually doing that every single week, and he truly is doing exceeding abundantly above all I could ever ask or think. And it's just continual week after week, and we've seen young people come to know the Lord, some people called to preach, called to missions, any sort of ministry, just to be uh, giving their lives to the Lord, surrendering their lives, and it's a sweet spirit there at that camp. We have one more week left. Um, like Pastor Cody said, I wasn't intending on staying this long, but we got to celebrate my grandparents' 50th anniversary last night, and uh, we were getting home really late from Boone, and so I called Brother Travis, asked me if he could use me this morning, so I got the privilege of hanging out with the children this morning in Children's Church, and then uh, Pastor Cody saw me and asked me if I'd open up God's Word and give a message tonight, and I sure am delighted to do that, and uh, I don't take this lightly. I'm very thankful that Pastor Cody would Give me the opportunity to do this, and I know that this is what God wants me to do, and I'm just trusting Him through it all. He's sure been faithful to me, and I know He's been faithful to you all, and this church has been a special privilege to me and a blessing, and I'm just thankful to be here. I'm thankful to see so many familiar faces, my family up there, and you know, I just hope that I can make my Lord and Savior proud, because He's done so much for me, and I'd rather just give it all to Him than anything else. And so with that being said, let's pray, and then we'll get into the preaching of God's Word. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given me. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to stand here and open up your word. Lord, you've been true and faithful all my life. And I thank you for um, the song that the teenagers just sang about, about your name and how it's the most wonderful name ever. And then how uh, Miss Allie and Brother Travis sang about how we can find everything at your feet. And Lord, we just need to kneel down before your name and before your throne and give it all to you. Because we can cast our cares upon you because you care for us. Lord, I pray that you'll bless the preaching of your word tonight. I pray that you'll use me just to be a vessel of honor for you. I pray that you'll speak to all of our hearts and lives today to make us more like Christ. I pray and ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in 1 Samuel tonight, and um, I'm very thankful for this passage of Scripture. It's, it's something that's really changed my heart and my life. And um, it's no small thing that I'd like to deal with tonight, but there's something that the Lord's impressed upon my heart. Um, you know, the context of 1 Samuel, we learn a lot about the children of Israel. All of their ups and all of their downs and all of their times when the Lord just wasn't in his rightful place, and that was all because of their sin. And you found that the Lord was still faithful to them, giving them exactly what they wanted, what they needed, even though they weren't putting all their trust and care upon him. And we find in this passage of Scripture, if we look in the background at chapter 8, we find that Israel demands a king. Every other nation in the world had a king, and Israel wanted to be just like them. They wanted to be just like every other, every other nation, to have all the material wealth and all the riches that they could physically see with their own eyes, they wanted that for themselves. They wanted a king, a physical king that they could bow down to and worship. Well, then we find that there's the theocracy that God designed, the, the government system, that God is to be the one true governing body and that everything else is supposed to fall underneath him. That's rejected and thrown out. Well, then Samuel being the high priest, they, see, they keep demanding for this king. We find in chapter 9 that Saul is chosen to be king. And in chapter 9 we see in verse 12 that, uh, let's see, Saul is chosen to be king in verse 12, and it says, And they answered them, and he said, Behold, he is. Behold, he is before you. Make haste now, and he came to the day of the city. I, I wrote that down wrong. Let me give you verse 2, actually. And he said, and he had a son whose name was Saul, excuse me, a choice young man, and a goodly. And there was not, mon, not, not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and, his, and, and upward, he was higher than any of the people. Saul was head and shoulders above the rest. He was somebody who was picked to be this king, and they wanted him. They wanted someone that they could look up to, and everyone else, when they looked upon their king, were going to be intimidated by Saul, and they wanted that man to be their king. So Saul becomes their king in chapter 10. He's anointed, and then we see in chapter 11 that Saul has this great victory at Jabesh Gilead, and you find at the end of chapter 11 that after this victory, 
after the children of Israel have rejected God and wanted exactly what the rest of the world had to offer, they start celebrating and offering up sacrifices to God with the king that they should have never had in the first place. And they start to see how their king, although as, as big and as tall as he may be, I don't know how tall he was, but I'm sure if he's head and shoulders above the rest, there's, he's this dude that they're looking at, and they're saying, man, this guy is exactly what we wanted. He's the king that we wanted, and we got him. And so we're just going to worship the Lord with the king that we should have never had in the first place because they rejected God's design of the theocracy. Well, we come to chapter 12, and this has been a very big chapter in my life and something that the Lord in the later part of it has really impressed upon my heart. This is Samuel's reminder to the nation of Israel. He's reminding them where they should be in the first place, who brought them there, and how they should wind up serving him and how they should live their lives to be pleasing and acceptable unto the Lord. If you look at me, or look at this verse, chapter in verse 16, we'll start reading here. Verse 16 of Samuel chapter 12. Now therefore stand and see with this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, and that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. And Samuel said unto his people, Fear not. Ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after the vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me... God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all of your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. I want to turn your attention back to verse 23 and 24. At the end of 23 will be our title, and verse 24 will be our, our main verse for this evening. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you, and here's our title, the good and the right way. What is that way? Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all of your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. There's been a theme this whole entire summer at Mount Moriah Christian Camp, and it's one that I love, and it's one I just can't get out of my heart. And I can't help but share it everywhere I go, and I, I pray that it will be a blessing to you and help you in your decision making in terms of following the Lord. There's a theme, it's four simple words, Take the high road. Take the high road. And it's pressed everywhere upon that campus. As soon as you walk into the tabernacle, there's this, here's the tabernacle with all hundreds of seats, and there's this, this big old green plaque right there that says, Take the high road. And it's something that you think about all the time you see it, but if no one were ever to explain to you, then you'd need, need a little explanation. So here, that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to give you this message about taking the high road. What does that mean? What does it mean to take the high road? Well, taking the high road is never choosing between the bad and the good and always choosing the good. Anybody can choose the good out of the bad. If you see something is, is super, super evil and wicked and sinful versus something that's pretty pleasant, you'd always pick the pleasant one, right? It's not choosing between the good and the bad. It's choosing between the good and the best and always choosing the best. In our Christian life, we're to take the high road. There are good options and then there's better options. There's best options that Christ would rather you do. If Christ holds the preeminence in your life, that top spot, and nothing else is on the radar, if Christ is that top spot, everything else seems to fall in order where it's supposed to go. So take the high road. Choose between the good and the best and always choose the best, right? That's exactly what Christ did, right? And so we see that, that that has been the theme. And so Samuel is reminding, as the high priest, mind you, the children of Israel are refusing him as, as the high priest, refusing his judgment, that he can give him in his form, in his government, that, that power that he holds. They're refusing that. So Samuel's simply reminding them of the good and the right way. And you and I have a decision to make every single day to choose the good and the right way. And to take it a step further, every single moment of our lives has to be choosing the good and the right way. That right way is certainly Christ, and it always has been, always for eternity will be. But it's all about you and I making that split decision and thinking, 
What would Christ do? What would Jesus do? What's that reminder that, that Christ gave us that we're to put into action, right? This word, this Bible, this Bible that we hold, this, this unfailing, unchanging word of God, it isn't just for you to read and say, well, that's good. It's for you to read, apply it to your life, and go and do what Christ tells you to do. So that's exactly what I want to look at tonight. The good and the right way. Proverbs 14, 12 simply tells us, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We know that the wages of sin is death, but we also know that Christ paid for that sin debt for us on Calvary. And I sure am grateful to know that I'm gloriously redeemed by the Savior of the world, who gave us life, who chose to die on a cross for our sins, he gave us eternal life. We hold that as a, if you're a saved, born-again believer, it's a present possession. It's not just some future promise that we have. We hold that and we'll live forever. But while we're still, on earth, we, while, while we're still here on earth, we got work to do. And it's time to, to pull the boots on and to get to work. And so we're going to choose the good and the right way. The wages of sin is death. Man always seems that they think they got it all figured out. There's time and time again I figured out even as a counselor at a Christian camp, you know, you think there's some ways that you can do it that's better than everything else. And there's moments in time when you just think that, that you got it all figured out and every week is just by schedule. You go by that schedule and everything's just going to be exactly how it was the week before. That is not the case. I tell you, some of these kids that I've had that first week, that first week with our kids, greatest week ever. I had Brother Travis in there in the cabin with me. He took care of business. If they weren't minding, their, uh, if they weren't minding then Travis took care of them and I just had to sit back and watch. The next week after that, I had, I had some bus kids from inner city Knoxville who weren't minding and... I didn't know how to take care of them. One week is not always the same as the next week. And I know one day isn't always the same as the next day. But I know that if I keep choosing the Lord instead of what my own opinion is or what I think is right, then I know I'll always come out with the Lord on top. He's already won the victory. But it just, it's all about figuring out what way that God would have to make that path right, the good and the right way. There's a way which seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I don't want to end up like that. I don't want to end up spending my life wasting it on something that the world would have to offer, whenever everything Christ has to offer is so much sweeter, right? It's sweeter as the days go by. It's sweeter every single moment in time. And I just know that if I can trust that, then everything else is going to fall into place exactly how it should. Trials or not, mountaintops and, and, and high victories or not, everything's going to fall the way Christ intended it to. So with that being said, I want to look back at verse 24. I've got three main points for you tonight that if you're taking notes that you can jot down, but... I want to look at verse 24, and I, I believe this has been my life first for a while, and this is, this is the message that I have to give to you, and this is what the Lord has impressed upon my heart, so I pray it will be a blessing. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all of your heart, for consider how great things He hath done for you. Point number one, only fear the Lord. Now, what does it mean to fear the Lord? I know we talk a lot about, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to explain to little kids what it means to fear the Lord, and it's hard to tell them that, Fear in the Lord isn't just that monster that's underneath your bed every night that'll come out and whenever you least expect it, it's going to jump out and scare you. No, that's not at all what this means. I know that, that there's been times whenever, one of my favorite games as a kid, I'll tell you this, was whenever my dad would be walking in a room and I'd just be right around the corner and he'd get off from work and I'd, I'd be behind the door and then no, he wouldn't suspect a single thing. As soon as that door closed, whoa, and he scared me. And he, he was never really scared, but he always gave me the... The jump scare, you know what I'm saying? And he always, he always made sure I knew that I scared him. And he, what that represented is I put a little fear in him, right? I put a little, uh, put a little mischief in him, put a little fear in him. But it, it, it wasn't this, this fear in the Lord isn't something that's just scary. This fear in the Lord is simply understanding that the fear of the Lord is the continual submission to God in humility and in faith. Every day Christ should have the preeminence in our life. That means that he's got the top spot and there's nothing else even on the radar below it except... Only Christ is up there, and everything you do, all your actions in terms of the Christian life and by faith are done by His motivating factor. He is the motivating factor that should drive us to do everything else that we do, right? He should always have the preeminence, and we should always get our joy through our faith that we have in Him, because it comes from nowhere else. Real joy will never come from anything else but Christ and remembering all that He's done for you. So simply only fear the Lord. That means to give Him the rightful reverence and to be exceedingly obedient to what he has. Let me read you what Proverbs 23, 17 says. Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. From the moment that you wake up to the moment you lay your head back down at night, we are to be in the fear of the Lord all day long. We are to give him his rightful place 
and to give him all the preeminence and to give him every bit of what he truly deserves. Because if you think about what Christ deserves, he certainly deserves every bit of our life because he freely gave every bit of what he had to me and to you. And that was the perfect picture on Calvary. John 3, 16 simply says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, I'm not a father yet. I don't, I don't have a son. But I can imagine, as a dad, how much love you have for your children. And I've seen that portrayed. My own father has done so much for me. And I can't thank my family enough for what he's done. But for Christ to give his only begotten son to pay the sin debt for me and for you is no small ordeal. It was simply an act of love, an unending love, a love that we never even know where it began from. He created us and loved us from the very moment that he created us. There was no beginning to it and there certainly will never be an end to it, right? We certainly didn't deserve it, but he gave it to you and to me. And so we're to give Christ his rightful spot and we're to give his son, God's son, all the glory because he certainly deserves it. So this fear in the Lord is this continual submission to God in humility and faith, always thinking of yourself always thinking of ourselves as lowly. We are no better than anyone else. We were all simply created in God's image with a purpose and a plan designed that he marked out and he simply states in his word. If you ever want to know the will of God, always search the word of God. That's always where you're going to find it. You'll never find it anywhere else because anything that you do, if it ever contradicts the Bible, then it's wrong. The Bible is certainly true and it will always stand true and there will never be a moment when God never keeps his promises. If he promises that his will is in his word, then certainly trust to it because it's lasted from then. This Bible was applicable in the founding of our nation. It's still applicable now and it will be until Christ returns and it's still going to hold the preeminence. And I'm just thankful that God certainly is true and faithful. So continually be in submission to God in humility, thinking of ourselves as lowly. All that we are are vessels for the Lord to use. I, was, I got the privilege of being with the, uh, the children's church this morning and we were in Hebrews chapter 10 talking about the church and how the church is the body of believers and we are to provoke unders, uh, others unto love and we're to consider others and exhort one another. You and I are no different from one another. Yeah, we all look the different. There's different demographics. There's different things that you can characterize each other as but all of us are made in the image of God. That's stated in Genesis that, that God said, let, let, let us make man in our image. That's God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We were created in his image with a specific purpose and a plan. So give Christ the preeminence. Only fear the Lord. Be submissive to him and live throughout that all the day long. Number two, I'd like to point out just the second part of the verse. Serve the Lord in truth. With what? All your heart. I've always wanted to say this in front of everybody. I, I know that Pastor Cody loves to say it. But he's got these catchphrases. How many of y'all at Pastor Cody has these catchphrases that just stick in your noggin all the day and you can't get off of them? I, I tell you what, I, I talk about your walk talks about once a week. And I also say that all means all, and that's all, all means. And I got that from Pastor Cody. And it is true, right? All means all, and that's all, all means. With every bit of what's inside of you, God desires to have it. Every fiber that you have, every cell that's in your body. You were created down to the, the microscopic cell. And through the cell, there's, there's the cytoplasm and the nucleus and, and the ribonucleic acid that makes up your DNA. Every bit of that was designed for a purpose, to make up your whole body and your being and God simply says that with all of your heart, with all of you, we are to serve the Lord. Why? Because he created us with a purpose and a plan. Back to point number one, only fear the Lord, right? The Lord should always be our motivating factor. Only serve the Lord with all of your heart. And that just simply means that even the little things, right? There was a message preached last week at church camp. There was a, uh, he, was talking about brother, uh, he was talking about David and how David was fighting Goliath. And the point that was made, even in passing, it was kind of one of those things that a preacher might say that he doesn't spend too much time on, that he just kind of passes through, but it kind of catches your ear. And it kind of gets you off guard a little bit, and the Lord starts pricking your heart about it, and you start thinking about it, and then you start giving God the glory and the praise for even giving you that thought. Well, he said that whenever David went to the battlefield to fight the Philistine, right, he never went thinking that he was going to fight Goliath in the first place. All he was was given a simple uh, task to go give food to his brothers, right? He had all these brothers on the battlefield. He had all this time and he was supposed to travel to where the battle was being fought and to simply deliver to his brothers from his father that gave it to him, right? His father Jesse gave him that task. But he never knew that he was going to fight Goliath until it actually was about to happen. And you find that David was, he was asking questions. He was, he was asking questions. He was like, why are we still here? We've been standing here for, for 40 days and nobody's moved. This giant has come over here on this battlefield and he's called out somebody for 40 days and no one has budged or moved an inch. And David's like, well, what are we going to do about it? Guys, come on, let's, let's get our hands together. Let's get going. And nothing happens, right? 
Well, then eventually he's just there to carry food, right? And eventually you know the story. It leads up, Saul tries to give him all this armor and it's, it's way too big for him and David's drooping down and all he needs is five, five, smooth stones, five smooth stones and a slingshot. That's all he needs. And what did God do? God slaying the giant, right? He used David to take that slingshot as he's running toward to sling it, hit him on the forehead, and he didn't even fall back. This is what also the preacher said this week. If you notice in the scripture, it says that Goliath fell on his face. And so uh, there's a, whether this is the case or not, it sounds good enough. He hit him right in the forehead. Normally you'd fall back, but as he's falling back, God slapped him on the head and he fell on the face. And that's exactly what the preacher said. And think about this, that's all God needed to use was a willing servant in David to go deliver food to his brothers and then go kill Goliath with that miracle. See, very, all, all, everybody wants to kill Goliath, but very few people want to carry the cheese to their brothers, right? Very few people want to be the servant that serves the Lord with every bit that's inside of them. I remember this, I, I, I thank this church for giving me the opportunity to do so much around here and, and you've been faithful and you've been willing to let me help out, especially these teenagers going into Bible school, you have an incredible opportunity and you're able to be in the classrooms and you're able to be one-on-one -on -one with these kids and get them the gospel. That's no small thing. Be praying about it because God's going to use you in a great way and I'm going to be praying for you. But I know that as a teenager, all I ever wanted to do was help out. And I'm sure he was tired of me, but Brandon Brooks was he was so sick and tired of me being on his right hip every single day. I remember in the summer, I'd be in his office every single morning. I'd be here before he got here. And I'd be waiting on him. My dad would be ready to drop me off or at the church, and then he'd get to go to work. But there were some days when Brandon would come in, you know, just a minute or two late. Not too bad. I'm sure he won't mind that I say that. But anyways, uh, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to be a help. And on Sundays and Wednesdays, if I was here, all I ever wanted to do was take these microphones right here, take this lapel, take Pastor Cody's lapel, and change the batteries. All I ever wanted to do was just be a help to some way to this church and change batteries. And I remember having a conversation with somebody one day, and I'm not in any shape or form giving me any of the glory because I certainly don't deserve it. I just give God the glory for helping and giving me an opportunity to do so. I told him, if all I ever do in a church is change batteries, then I'll give all the glory and I'll be happy doing it. I'll be happy that Jesus entrusted me to be able to change a battery so that somebody could hear the preacher speak the word of God. Because the word of God certainly has power. But all I ever wanted to do was be a help. And I, I think it's so great that, that Hudson and Titus and Ian and, and whoever else get to go sit up in the sound booth and work with the live stream. And they get, to, they get to be trusted with getting the word out to the whole entire world. Everybody's on the internet now. And it's, it's opportunity like those just to give the gospel out on the, on the radio broadcast, on the TV. And that's, that's all for a purpose. So we can go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. These right here, that's not just some decorative piece. And that's not just anything. That's the word of God right there in Mark. That's what it says. That's what I keep reminding myself. Every time I look at this, this right here, you see the world. And then go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Christ wouldn't tell us to go preach the world to every creature if it wasn't possible. It's just time to get moving, time to get on the job and to serve the Lord with all of our heart. And that's exactly what this message has to say. So only fear the Lord, serve Him in truth with all of your heart. Why? It's simply stated, as the, as the last part of that verse says. <clears throat> it says, for consider how great things He hath done for you. If you're sitting here tonight and you have no clue at all what I'm talking about, about the Lord. And like Brother Cody said this morning, if, if you don't know anything about this Jesus thing or this God thing or this Holy Spirit, here it is. Let me give it to you plain and simple. John 3, 16, once again. For God so loved the world. God being the creator of the whole universe, spoke it into existence in six literal days and rested on the seventh. He gave his only son to set you and me free. See, we had a sin debt built up, right? For for by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. That was Adam. That was Adam and Eve in the garden. And we find that they, their flesh failed and they gave in to the serpent because the Bible says that the serpent was more subtle than any other beast in the, in the field. And what he had to say was, was so close to the truth. It was so close to what God had to say. But it was all a lie because it was all for the devil. It was all not correct. It was all not what the word of God said to Adam and Eve directly. Mind you, Adam and Eve were able to communicate with God in the garden. They were able to walk with him and talk with him. And Adam was able to name all the creatures and all the fowls of the air and everything in the ocean, everything, beasts of the field. Adam had that communication and that, that one, that two-way able, that street with God. And the devil comes in and he just lies to him. He pricks him just a little bit and he's, he's like, well, this is kind of close to the truth. And then Eve starts to eat of the fruit. And everybody always portrays it as, 
as Adam was, you know, maybe far off in the distance, as Eve is over there about to eat the fruit, and he's just la di da di da you know, what is this, what is this? No, it says that the Bible, that, that Adam was with him and ate, and ate of the fruit with her. He was right there the whole time. And you understand that man fell in the garden. And by that, for the wages of sin is death, right? So death entered in the world and death by sin. And so for all of sin to come short of the glory of God, you and I, once again, are just sinners. But if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you're saved by grace. And you have that present possession of eternal life. And it certainly is important to know that you can get that settled today. So look at the motivating factor of all of this. For consider how great things He hath done for you. I can point out families in this church right now who God has brought you through different situations. Just off the top of my head, I think about Locke and the miracle that was to bring him back. And how Locke is living his life for the Lord now. And how Opal was also adopted. And how all of y'all, y'all have went through decisions in teen camp. And you've made choices for the Lord that I pray you're sticking to. And you're using your talents to sing up here for the Lord. And many of you are doing solos. And I just pray that somebody, will, so somebody one of these in this teen group will get called to preach. And they'll also go into the ministry. And they'll also give their Lord their whole life. And even if it isn't behind a pulpit or it isn't preaching God's word, in an everyday job, a nine to five, a, a whatever the situation may be, consider how great things th that God has done for you, right? Consider the Lord and how great the Lord is. That's just simply what this has to say. And we find that, that, um, we find that later on in Saul's life in 1 Samuel, we find that in a moment whenever Samuel wasn't near the high priest and the high priest was to make sacrifices for the, for the wages of sin that was not going to be for eternally, it was only going to be for a specific amount of time. It wasn't going to satisfy for forever. But Saul went ahead and jumped the gun and he decides to make a sacrifice and to, and to mess up. And Samuel walks in and says, what are you doing? And, and, and Samuel describes it here in, um, let's see, in verse 11 of chapter 13. It says, and Samuel said, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me, that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves uh, together at Michmash, therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I, I, let's see, I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God. Samuel went ahead, or Saul went ahead and jumped the gun and was just foolish in everything that he did. And we find that later on it doesn't end well for Saul. And we find that it, it doesn't have a happy ending. You know what? You want to know why? Because he never only feared the Lord and served him in truth with all of his heart. And he didn't consider all the great things that God had done for him. Saul was never supposed to be the king in the first place. Israel rejected the theocracy, the main part where God was supposed to be the preeminence and the government power right there that everything else fell under. They rejected that. And they wanted a king like everything else the world had. Let's, take a, let's walk a mile in their shoes. How many times have you ever saw something that someone else had and you said, I want that for myself. And you sinned to get it. It was never as pleasing as it would have been if you would have just got it the way God intended you to. Maybe it's the circumstance that you find yourself in, the job that you have. Maybe it's what you fill in the blank for whatever it has to do with your life. If you're sinning to get what you want, it's never going to end up well. And there will never be eternal satisfaction than what it would have been if God would have just gave it to you in His time, in His place, in His presence, and in His divine authority and His way of doing it. Right, The good and the right way. If you would have got it in the good and the right way... Everything else would have been fine. They should have never had Saul in the first place, but Saul was able to be the king. He was anointed. And then the children of Israel find themselves again just back in sin and wondering, like, what, what is going on? What have we got ourselves into? Samuel simply has to remind him and say, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all of your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. Look back at chapter 12, verse, um, verse 13. This is what... Samuel says to him before all this even goes down, this, this time of the harvest and then God sends the rain and the thunderstorms and they're like, God, we're going to die because all of our crops are, are going to be out of, the, out of the count. We're not going to be able to eat. We're going to starve. Or, and Samuel's just simply, only fear the Lord. Serve him in truth with all of your heart. Look at verse 13 of, of chapter 12 before all this goes down. Samuel, Samuel simply told him, Now therefore behold the king whom ye have chosen, that's Saul, and whom ye have desired, Saul, and behold the Lord hath set a king over you. What you should have never had in the first place, even though you desired it, God was still your God and he gave it to you, right? That's what that says. Verse 14, if ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. He said, listen, you can have a king, but if you just keep following the Lord, 
obeying His voice, giving Him the top-notch spot, the preeminence, then it'll be fine. You can live with your king and you can live with your God, having the preeminence and having everything that He deserves. Well, look at the contrast in verse 24 and 25. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all of your heart, for consider how great things He hath done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. God simply puts it, both ye and your king are going to be consumed. Burn up, gone, away. That's only going to happen if you don't serve the Lord and don't fear Him and don't serve Him in truth with all of your heart and don't consider how great things He had done for you. Now let's put it to our lives, right? As we conclude, let's think about this. It may not be a king. It may be something material. It may be something that, that everyone else in the school has to, has to offer, guys. It may be the temptation of sin. It may be the wickedness in this world. It may be uh, conversations with, with coworkers. It may be whatever material thing that you think you got to get to a- ASAP and say, that's what I want, and that's what I want just with all of my heart. If that's what you want and it's not Christ, then it's not going to be worth it because let me tell you how the conclusion is. It's going to be consumed, both you and the thing that you desire that God never intended you, for you to have. And that's just how the story goes. It's not supposed to be a d- discouraging message. The message is simply to say, to bring all of us to a decision today that says today, in every single moment, I'm going to take the high road. I'm going to choose between the good and the best, and I'm always going to choose the best. I'm always going to choose Christ because I can consider all the things that He's done for me, and that's going to be my motivating factor to only fear Him and serve Him in truth with all of my heart. That's the message. There's the decision to make. And now it's up to me and you just to simply do it. Right? We shouldn't only be hearers of God's word. We should also be doers. If God simply commands us to do this, then I think we should do it. So it's time to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Right? There's a picture of it. The world. There's so many areas to reach. Even this right here. Chilhowee, Virginia is a wonderful mission field. There's still lost people in Chilhowee, Virginia. And we constantly abide here every day. And this is where God has us. So what are you going to do? What's going to be the challenge for you today? What are you going to do to get the gospel to somebody? And how are you in your daily life only going to fear the Lord, serve Him in truth with all of your heart, and then consider how great things He hath done for you? I'll pray and then I'll let Pastor Cody extend the invitation as he sees fit.